Our scripture this morning comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another who came up, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. God blesses always the reading from the Holy Bible. Let us pray. God, may the words from my lips in the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight. Amen. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Those words have always been considered to be the hinge, the pivotal spot in Luke's gospel as he tells the story about Jesus' ministry. From beginning to chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus has been in Galilee, mostly in Galilee. But beginning with verse 51, he turns his face to go to Jerusalem. And from chapter 9, verse 51, to chapter 19, verse 27, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to meet his destiny. Chapter 19, verse 28, he enters Jerusalem on the day that we call Palm Sunday. So this is the pivotal verse in Luke's gospel about Jesus' life and Jesus' ministry. Up to this point, he's been in Galilee From this point forward, he's headed to Jerusalem to meet his destiny. Now, there are many ways that any verse of Scripture can be applied to our daily lives. It seems to me that one way we could apply this Scripture to our daily lives is that it tells us we must meet rejection with grace. Because isn't Jesus rejected here again? He is coming to a Samaritan village, and they refuse to accept him. And James and John want retribution, don't they? James and John want to draw to take a page from Elisha's book and bring fire down to consume the village. So they say to Jesus, Lord, will you have us bring fire down and destroy this village for rejecting you? Jesus says, chill, we're going on down the road to another village. We have to learn to accept rejection because life is filled with rejection. Jesus is rejected from the very beginning of his ministry, remember? He comes 
to the Jordan River and is baptized by John the Baptist. He goes immediately from his baptism into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to figure out God's claim on his life because the heavens have opened while he's being baptized and the spirit in the form of a dove lands on him. We read about that in Luke 3. He comes up out of the waters of the Jordan River. He goes immediately into the wilderness where he stays 40 days and 40 nights to try to figure out what God's claim on his life is. And what does he do when he comes out of the wilderness? He goes immediately to his hometown. He goes to, to Nazareth and he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth. And he reads from Isaiah chapter 58. And then he says... In your presence, this scripture has been realized. And what do his hometown folks say? Are they proud that the hometown boys come home? No, this is what they do. When they heard him say this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, led him to the cliff on the hill so that they might hurl him off the cliff. Who do you think you are, buddy? They're saying. You come out of the wilderness feeling like you're somebody special and you're going to come tell us that in your presence the Holy Scripture is being revealed. Who do you think you are? So from his very first day in ministry, His very inaugural sermon, his first sermon, he's rejected by his town folk. They want to throw him off the cliff. So Jesus is rejected from day one. He's rejected in this village that he wants to come to today. He finally gets to Jerusalem, and what happens when he gets to Jerusalem? His own people hand him over to the Romans for execution. Jesus knows what it means to be rejected. And I believe part of what this scripture is telling us is we have to be able to accept rejection with grace. The disciples want retribution. Jesus says, no, that's not what we do. We're going on down the road to another village. Another lesson we could get from this scripture would be that we have to have single-minded determination to reach our goal. What do we read here? He set his face to go to Jerusalem. Nothing was going to distract him from realizing God's claim on his life. And as he's making his way, three people come up to him. The first one says, Lord, Lord, I want to follow you. Jesus says, really? The son of foxes have dens, birds of the air have nests. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. If you follow me, you may not even have any place to sleep. So make sure you really want to come. The second guy says, Lord, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bury my father. Well, that man's father would be alive because in Jewish custom of that day, the moment somebody was dead, they were buried for cleanliness law. What this man really was saying was, my dad's getting old. He's aging. Let me go and take care of him until he dies, and then I'll come. And Jesus says, leave the dead to bury their own. Come now, not later, not when all of your family obligations are met. Come now. Third guy comes up and he says, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go home and say farewell to my people at home. That seems like a reasonable request. But Jesus is just as hard on him, isn't he? Jesus says no one who looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Come now. We're going forward. 
Don't look back. What this scripture is about unmistakably is that making a discipleship decision means that you are becoming fully committed. Not volunteers, not part-time employees, fully committed. Alcoholics Anonymous in their big book put it like this. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked God's care with complete abandon. We stood at the turning point. Half measures availed us nothing. We asked and surrendered ourselves to God with complete abandon. What this text is telling us is that making a discipleship decision is not a career choice. It's not becoming a nicer person. Making a discipleship decision is saying, I'm becoming a totally new person. I'm assuming a new identity. I have reached the turning point. I am giving myself to God with complete abandon. Most of us, like the three who came to Jesus saying, I'll follow you, Lord, but... Most of us think we want to make a discipleship decision. But we want to stick our toe in the water first. Because we don't want to make promises we can't keep. I'm reminded when I was a young man considering ministry, my mentor and my pastor, Carver McGriff. I went to St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Indianapolis and Carver McGriff was the pastor. And Carver started talking with me around 1977 or 78 saying, you know, George, you really should consider going to theological seminary and becoming ordained in the United Methodist ministry. And I remember in particular the the Wednesday before Thanksgiving in 1979, Carver and I were talking in a restaurant on West 86th Street because I was participating in a Thanksgiving service the next day and we were going over parts of that service and Carver started the conversation again in 1979. I remember it clearly. It was 40 plus years ago, but I remember it clearly. I could tell you the restaurant we were on on West 86th Street, except it's no longer there. It's now part of St. Vincent's Hospital. But I had it all in line. I said to Carver, well, Carver, I'd love to do that, but I can't do it. I've got three kids. Four, because Sarah wasn't born yet, but at the time I had three. I said, Carver, I've got three kids. I've got a lucrative and secure profession. I've got commitments, man. I've got a mortgage. I've got financial obligations. I can't just up and quit. I got people who rely on me. And then I had the finale. I thought it sealed the deal. I said, Carver, I can't quit work. And a Master of Divinity is 90 hours. And that's three years full time. And I couldn't possibly do that. I'd have to go part time. I'd have to do six hours a semester. It would take me six years to finish this. And in six years, I'll be 37 years old before I can even qualify for provisional ordination. And I'd be 39 years old before I could be ordained. 
Carver sat with great patience, as was his custom. And then he looked at me and he said words I've never forgotten. I can't forget the expression on his face, or the tone of his voice. This is a guy who's still alive. He landed, he was one of those who landed on June 6, 1944 on the beaches of Normandy. He wrote a book later, Making Sense of Normandy. He knows what pressure is about. And he says to me, he unmasks my arguments for just what they were. I didn't want to leave a familiar, comfortable, predictable life and start a new life. I didn't want to do it. So Carver said to me two things I'll never forget. He said, George, how old are you going to be in six years whether or not you go to seminary? And secondly, he said, I was 37 when I was ordained a provisional elder, and I was 39 when I was ordained an elder. Just like you, pal. What Carver was saying to me was, fish or cut bait, pal. Don't say I want to follow, but. Now I hasten to say, and hear me on this, not all disciples are going to go to theological seminary and become ordained pastors. Most disciples, most of you are architects or you're accountants or you're business people or you're police officers or you're nurses or you're teachers or you're farmers. You're not ordained pastors. The disciples didn't go to theological seminary, did they? The original 12. And in, in some ways, Carver regretted that I was going into ordained ministry. In some ways, he said, George, you know, your witness, your witness as a lay person, as a secular person, is more salient in many ways than it will be when you're an ordained pastor because when you become an ordained pastor, people are going to say, well, of course he's saying that stuff. He wants us to come to his church. But as a secular person, if you're making that witness, powerful so remember your voice is powerful well we're talking about pivotal moments here Jesus this is the pivotal moment in Luke's gospel he turned his face to go to Jerusalem to meet his destiny well this is a pivotal moment for this congregation isn't it I think as you prepare to receive a new pastor We'd be wise to revisit the commitment that you made to the church and remember the vows you made to the church when you joined. Because when you joined the church in the United Methodist Church, you stood before God and the congregation and you made sacred vows that you would share your whole life with Christ in the church. Almost like marriage vows. You promised to support the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, your witness. Well, the first two of those, you say, well, I can do that, my prayers and my presence. Presence like presence in the congregation, not presence like money. I can do those first two. I can support the church with my prayers, and I can support the church by being present in the pews. I can do those two. Now, the next two, I'm not so sure. My gifts and my service, money and time, I'm not so sure about that. I've, I don't have enough of either one of those to share, but I'll give what I can. And then the final one, witness. We'll support the church with our witness. Oh, wait a minute, that's hard. That's really hard to do. 
It's okay to witness to people who are already here. We can witness to like-minded believers. But you expect us to go out in the, in the streets and witness? Go out in our places of work? Go out in our neighborhoods? Go to people who don't even go to church and bear witness to Jesus Christ? You want us to do that? No, that's why we have a preacher. That's why we have a preacher. The preacher's the witness. But this text today is saying, Jesus is saying, I don't want any part-time workers. I don't want any part-time workers. I'm reminded in Revelation, where in Revelation chapter 3, the revelator says, your lukewarm witness causes God to vomit. The word vomit's not used, but that's, that's the meaning. Jesus, in this scripture, is telling the three would-be people, I don't need part-time work. I need somebody who is fully invested. Somebody who is willing to come to work full-time for me. Otherwise, leave the dead to bury their own. If you want to look back and go back home and say goodbye to everybody, you're not fit. Because anyone who looks back is unfit for the kingdom. These are harsh words, aren't they? These are expectant words. And they're directed to us. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ today, maybe more than any time in my lifetime, is in dire need of committed witnesses. I believe people are in a search for the sacred. I believe that our leisure and our affluence, and I don't care what your level of affluence is, every person in this room has leisure. We have more leisure and more affluence than we need. We have more in this world than we need. And the fact that it doesn't satisfy us, that still leaves us longing, tells us deep in our soul that we need to look to the eternal and not the temporal. I believe people are hungry to associate with a church that's going to make a lasting difference in the world. And it's going to be a vital witness in the world. People are hungry for that. So as you prepare to receive a new pastor... And as that pastor assembles a team, the best gift you can give him is your full commitment. Your full commitment. Not the yes buts. The important thing is where we're headed. Not where we are this morning. Remember, Jesus never gave up on those people who came up and said, we want to follow you, Lord. We're going to follow you. We promise we'll follow you, except we've got other things to do for a while. Jesus didn't give up on those people, did he? Even though they vacillated, Jesus didn't give up on them. He continued to love them. And at his death, the Holy Spirit filled those people, some of those people, with courage and power to bear witness. And those people 
put themselves in harm's way. And they changed the world. And those people are what the church needs today. Those people can be you people.